Uh, welcome. My name is Elizabeth Angel. I'm ERI's Communications and Program Manager, and I'd like you to welcome to this webinar today. Welcome you to this webinar today on behalf of ERI. If you're not familiar with us, uh, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute is the leading nonprofit membership organization dedicated to connecting multidisciplinary professionals working on earthquake resilience, both in the United States and around the globe. And our members include people from a wide range of backgrounds and fields uh, working together on this cause. By joining ERI, and there's a link there to show you how to, uh, where to join us, uh, you become part of this global network. Uh, this webinar today is presented as part of our flagship Learning from Earthquakes program. Through LFE, ERI conducts multidisciplinary reconnaissance and is share, sharing lessons from earthquakes around the world. Uh, I think for over um, 50 years now, this is actually our 50th anniversary year, um, and with information on more than 300 earthquakes around the world. And our website there is where you can find a lot of that information archived and stored. And that work is made possible in part by the LFE Endowment Fund. Uh, we're fundraising this year to make this work sustainable into the future, and you can learn more at the website uh, and here. Finally, I just really want to quickly mention that we'll be having our annual meeting this spring in San Francisco, California in April. This year, it's going to focus on the 50th anniversary of LFE and on earthquake reconnaissance more broadly with a lot of exciting opportunities and workshops for ERI members and other attendees to gain more hands-on and practical skills uh, and be part of this work. So you can check out the uh, both the program and other information about the meeting at the website there and register. And we also have registration grants available. The deadline for those is the 1st of February. So if you want to apply for one of those, please do so soon. On that note, I'm gonna hand it over to our moderator today, uh, Dr. Gilberto Mosqueda. Uh, hi, thank you, Elizabeth. Hi and welcome everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here with, with you today. We have a, a great series of speakers lined up today to inform you on uh, some of the events that occurred on uh, September 18, 2022 in, uh, in, uh, in Taitung, Taiwan. Um, we have, um, I was actually in Taiwan before the earthquake and actually, and actually here now again, as part of a collaborative effort with, with uh, working with, with ANCRI. And I had the opportunity to go out in the field with, uh, with uh, Professor Cho, who's a director of ANCRI, who will be speaking on, on, on the structural aspects of some of the reconnaissance. But first we'll get started with, uh, um, with, with Erica Fisher. Um, Erica is, our, uh, is an assistant professor in the John and, John and John Lee Lucy Faculty Fellow in the College of Engineering at Oregon State University. And she's also the virtual earthquake reconnaissance uh, team uh, leader, uh, also known as VERT. And she's going to speak on uh, the overview of the earthquake and the ERI response to this effort. So I'll hand it over to um, Erica. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Mosqueda. Um, so uh, my name is Erica Fisher, and um, I am a co-chair of the Virtual Earthquake Reconnaissance Team, along with Dr. Manny Hakmaneshi um, as well. And, um, and so I'm going to talk today a little bit about our response to this earthquake, why ERI decided to actually initiate a response to this earthquake. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the report um, and, and some of our findings, um, but I will have some, some links throughout the report, throughout this presentation, um, so that you all can access the report um, um, on your own and, and go through it. It's, it's quite comprehensive. Um, so first and foremost, um, this was actually an earthquake sequence. Um, and so on November 17th, on September 17th and 18th of 2022, there was an earthquake sequence in, in Taiwan. Most of you know that's why you're here. Um, this consisted of a moment magnitude 6.5 earthquake followed by a moment magnitude 6.9 earthquake near Taichung City in Taiwan. These earthquake sequences with consequent large magnitude events separated by short time intervals have been occurring in different parts of the world in the past years and ERI has responded to many of them. Um, therefore, this, this particular earthquake sequence was, was responded to by ERI because of the nature of the damage and because it was this pre-shock, aftershock sequence that occurred. Um, we wanted to really understand these types of events a little bit better. Their cumulative effects um, are not characterized and considered in design codes of buildings and other infrastructure systems. So ERI found it important to examine this study um, and, and this particular earthquake. 
So just a little bit of uh, the, the timeline of ERI's response. So we had the earthquakes on um, uh, September 17th and 18th. And um, by September um, 18th, ERI began their response with um, through an assembly of a, of a virtual team. Um, this then um, continued um, um, for about five days um, when the editors began and, and wrapped up their editing of the report. Um, so we had authorship of the reports as well as um, specific reviewers of the report. And I'll show you the, the title page in a second so you can see all that was involved in this. Um, and then it went off to, to ERI for final um, edits and approval before it was published on October 10th. Um, and here is a QR code if those of you who are sitting at home on your computers and, and want to scan this QR code, um, you will be able to access this report um, yourself and go through it. It's, uh, again, I don't have enough time today to go through all of the sections of the report. Um, so I do recommend you, you take a look. Um, this considered um, this this report consisted of 30 different authors spanning both industry and academia, also spanning eight different countries. The report was not a, a collaborative official report with STEER, um, but it was reviewed by STEER members to provide a comprehensive um, singular report coming out of um, the ERI STEER organizations. Um, the report was then published on uh, Design Safe, which is what the QR code is going to bring you to, where you'll see a DOI for the report. Um, it's also on the LFE website. And um, the report was a true collabor collaboration with all the LFE subcommittees. They were invited to um, contribute to the report and um, research um, various publicly available information that had direct impacts on um, their subcommittees. And if you would like to sign up for the Virtual Earthquake Reconnaissance Team, um, here is the QR code that brings you to the sign up page, um, or you can find this on the, um, on the ERI website. Okay, so uh, back to back to the report itself. So, um, what is this report, and 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 why did we do this? Um, so, this is a a word document report. So, it looks a little bit differently than what we traditionally see as a product of Vert. Um, so, it's about a hundred pages. Um, you can see all of the authors on the screen, um, and this provided a a summary of the, of the characteristics of the event, but also an overview of the main effects of the earthquake as they were collected um, from publicly available information. We were able to work with people who are in the field to um, try and ground truth as much as we could, but a lot of this came from um, information that we were able to find um, through publicly available sources. Um, the, the purpose of the report and the goal of the report was also to provide recommendations for those um, engineers and those scientists who wanted to go into the field. What information did we find most interesting coming out of um, the data that we were collecting? Um, and what do we recommend people look into um, if they are going to assemble a field team? Um, so the, the report sections um, covered everything from seismological aspects to local codes and construction practices um, so that those who are reading the report can have some contextual information as to uh, what, you know, what other earthquakes occurred in the region previously, but also how these buildings are, are constructed. Um, damage to infrastructure, damage to buildings, um, and um, as well as you know, observed geotechnical failures Current, the current conditions and access, so where we saw that um, a lack of access was, was existing, which is really helpful for infield teams. And um, then lastly, as I mentioned, some recommendations. Um, so my the the, the co-presenters in this webinar are going to touch upon a lot of these report sections. Um, there's absolutely no way I can touch upon all of these. Um, in in the next you know a uh, few minutes that I have to to cover this presentation, so I'm going to kind of dabble in a few of these topics, um, and they're all they're all kind of centered around our recommendations of what we thought was most interesting that came out of of the data that we were collecting virtually. 
Okay, so our recommendations really covered, um, you know, that, that there was an earthquake early warning system in Taiwan, um, and, and, and um, you know, whenever there is an earthquake early warning system within a country that experiences um, the, these types of events, um, we, we want to study them and, and understand how the earthquake early warning system worked. Um, we saw um, a lot of damage to reinforced concrete bridges, so um, we recommended anyone going in the field um, that they, they take a look at, at the behavior of reinforced concrete bridges. And I'll, I'll cover that a little bit um, in the next few slides. Um, landslides and rock falls, there was a lot of geotechnical damage that, that fell under that category. Um, Dr. Ben Mason will cover that in depth and probably more comprehensively and better than I could ever do. So I'm going to leave that to him. Um, and non-structural components, um, there was a lot of non-structural components that spanned all types of occupancies of buildings. Um, there were a lot of identification of vulnerable buildings. And then, of course, this was an earthquake sequence. So, um, you know, taking a look at, at, at what the the compounding um, damage was due to that earthquake sequence. Um, so I'm going to start with um, a little bit of the earthquake aspects um, and then kind of dive into some of these topics here briefly um, before passing it off to some of the co-presenters that will probably give a, a much more deeper dive into, um, into these topics. Okay, so um, focusing on the earthquake aspects itself, um, we saw that um, the W phase moment tensor inversion solution of the earthquake um, reported by USGS indicated a strike slip vocal mechanism. Um, we saw that um, there was one nodal plane corresponding to a left lateral movement on the fault striking in the northeast southwest direction, and the other indicating a right lateral movement on the fault striking in the southeast northwest direction. Um, both the nodal planes presented a slight thrust component and a steep dipping. Um, from the data from USGS, we were able to find that the causative plane seemed more likely defined by the fault plane um, one, striking in the southeast northwest direction. Um, and this was consistent with what we saw from satellite imagery as well. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, Taiwan does have an earthquake early warning system. Um, it's distributed through TV, text, public broadcasting. Um, they give about a two to eight second warning around the epicenter, um, and it's a hybrid system. Um, they also have an alert system through Facebook and Twitter that alerts within 20 seconds of the earthquake and a substantial amount of instrumentation located throughout um, the region. Um, NCRE also has an earthquake early warning system, which I'm sure you all hear about um, in their presentations, um, that ties into an alert broadcast system at over 3,500 schools across Taiwan um, to receive on-site alerts as well as um, regional alerts. So some of the bridge damage that that we were able to see from our um, from the data that we collected through publicly available um, information, um, the Taiwan Bridge Management System has an inventory of about 28,000 bridges with approximately 30% of them over 30 years old and another 30% with an unknown construction date. Um, so there was a number of older bridges. Um, if we looked at where there was bridge damage, um, we can see the, the epicenter um, is this purple dot over here. Um, and then we see the um, uh, the red bridge icons is, is where we saw um, or we were able to find bridge damage um, or collapse um, throughout the impacted region. Um, so there were uh, two earthquake collapses um, the, in, um, in the affected regions and five bridges that we found to have permanent deformation or heavy damage. The um, Gallio Bridge um, had damage caused to most of the bridge piers and columns um, cause it, that caused collapse. Um, this was a main linkage between two areas. Um, so this, this really cut off access um, to these two areas. And that's, that's something that we talked about and we talked about in the report of the lack of access um, because of this bridge damage. Um, the entire straight portion of the bridge collapsed in the transverse directions, um, and and it's it's assumed that um, what, what we assumed was that the deck served as a rigid diaphragm to the columns um, between the inspan hinges, um, and and so when the columns reached their drift capacity all at the same time, if they all had the same um, transverse and and lateral reinforcement, um, they all collapsed at the at the same time, um, causing the, causing the damage that you're seeing on the screen. 
We also saw a lot of other bridge damage um, that, that was just damage, not collapse. Um, and we were seeing a lot of themes of deck damage to the to the bridges, as you're seeing on the right side of the screen. Um, and these are just two examples of deck damage to bridges. There was um, a lot more um, in the in the report. Um, the behavior of non-structural components is highlighted quite a bit throughout the report. We saw a lot of non-structural component damage. Uh, I think we all saw the video of the badminton court um, and the ceiling tiles all falling down, but we also saw ceiling tiles um, damaged in, in schools and commercial structures. Um, we saw shelving units um, fall over in schools, as well as commercial structures like grocery stores, um, um, as well as uh, more um, retail retail in environments. Um, we saw utility some utility damage, uh, mainly within the building itself, so flooding of a septic tank within the school, uh, as well as a rupture of the sprinkler lines um, in an IKEA. Okay, so um, the, the whole point of this presentation is sort of to kick us off and to, to provide you with an overview of ERI's response. Um, and so, uh, you know, please check out the report. Um, it, is, uh, it has a lot more information than I could cover today, um, but it does provide this summary of the characteristics that we saw um, and some interesting um, damage that, that we thought was, would be um, interesting to look at in the field. Before I pass it back to Dr. Mosqueda, I do want to thank and acknowledge um, ERI Learning from Earthquakes and all of the co-authors of this report, um, as well as the co-reviewers. Um, the Nahiri community was really um, helpful in, in getting this um, report out to the public. Um, Dr. Mosqueda was in the field and, and helped us out a little bit while um, we were looking looking through all of the publicly available information and 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 create, um, for for sharing their information and their data, um, as well us for co-presenting in this webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. Um, so we're going to move on to the next speaker. If you have any questions, you have the, the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen, so you can uh, ask any questions there. We'll try to answer questions that have short answers uh, as we go. And if there's time at the end of the, of, of, uh, of the session, we could try to answer some of those questions live. So again, please try to uh, write in any questions at any time in the in the Q and A panel um, at, at the bottom of your uh, with the link at the bottom of your screen. Um, the next speaker is, uh, is going to be uh, on earthquake geology, and and uh, we have the pleasure of having with us uh, Dr. J. Bruce uh, Xu, who's a distinguished professor in the Department of Geoscience at National Taiwan University, focusing on earthquake geology, tectonic tectonic geomorphology, and and neo-tectonics. Um, uh, Dr. Xu? Thank you, Kyoboro. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation from ERI and uh, NCRI. All right, so thank you. So uh, my name is Bruce Xu and uh, uh, I'm, I'm an ge uh, earthquake geologist. So uh, today I'm going to uh, share with you some of these uh, um, uh, our our understanding of these uh, characteristics of the uh, seismogenic structure of this September 2022 earthquake series. So uh, in short, so the uh, seismogenic structure, uh, we call the central range fault system. As many of you know that uh, the Longitudinal Valley in Eastern Taiwan is actually a uh, tectonically very, very active uh, region being uh, part of the uh, plate, uh, 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 convergence belt. So uh, there is a very primary active fault uh, along this uh, valley. Uh, the red line uh, on this figure, we call it the uh, Longitudinal Valley Fault. The Longitudinal Valley Fault is uh, both uh, seismically active, um, producing quite a few earthquakes, and it's also creeping uh, at the surface right now. Uh, along the fault, there are many uh, median-sized earthquakes uh, in uh, historical record. For example, in uh, the most recent uh, uh, years, 2022 and 2003, there are two uh, upper six earthquakes. And then earlier in uh, 1972, there's also a magnitude 6.9. Uh, also, historically, uh, there are two 
October 1951 earthquakes seven plus in the northern part of the uh, uh, fault. And also in November 1951, there are also two uh, up uh, magnitude seven plus uh, in the uh, central and southern part of the fault. So basically this, uh, this fault is very, very active seism uh, seismically. But then on the other hand, we also have a fault on the western side of the uh, Longitudinal Valley. We call it Central Range Fault. This fault was originally identified through geomorphology in the uh, central part of the valley. So here we can see there is a uplifted uh, uh, river terrace. And if we cut a cross section across this uh, river terrace, we can see that it's actually an folded anticline on the uh, hanging wall of this uh, central range fault system. And at the base of this, uh, 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 we call it tableland, we can see that the uh, uh, metamorphic uh, rock of the slate basement uh, cropping out uh, at the base of this uh, um, tableland. So again, supporting the idea that uh, basically this entire tableland, this, uh, uh, this uh, terrace is on the hanging wall of this uh, uh, central range fault uh, and belongs to this uh, central range metamorphic belt system. Uh, here you can only see that uh, the uh, blue line is only appear on the uh, central part of the valley. The north, we believe this fault is uh, becoming deeper, blind, uh, but still continue further to the north. And then also to the south, uh, a similar situation, the fault become blind and deeper. Why do we think about, uh, why do we think that is the case? Because uh, in the past decades, there are quite a few uh, smaller but, and deeper earthquakes uh, with a west dipping uh, fault plan that uh, along this northern part of the uh, Longitudinal Valley. Also, in the southern part in 2006, we have a similar uh, west dipping uh, earthquake uh, that is also deeper and uh, along this uh, southern extension of the uh, Central Range Fault System. And of course, uh, the uh, September 2022 events, uh, including the foreshock and the main shock, we believe it's also along this system. Um, except for these two major structures, actually the things are a little bit complicated in the central part of the valley. If we blow up this, this area, we can see that between these two faults, there is another fault, we call it the Yuli fault, that is between the two faults and in the center of the, uh, in the middle part of the valley. And this fault is act, was actually defined by surface rupture of the uh, November 1951 earthquake. As you can see, the red line here are the surface ruptures of the November 1951 earthquake. And the blue lines there are the active faults that we know, but without surface rupture, did not ruptured in November 1951. So this Yuli fault is appearing only in this part of the valley uh, because that is uh, the uh, surface rupture of the uh, 1951 earthquake. Uh, what, according to historical documents in the middle of the valley, inside the Yuli town, we can clearly see this very nice uh, clear evidence of this left laterally offset uh, surface rupture. So because it's not on um, neither the uh, Longitudinal Valley Fault nor the uh, Central Range Fault, uh, there is there is a fault identified in the middle of the valley. So if we cut a cross section across the uh, central part of the valley, it will be something look like this. We have a east dipping Longitudinal Valley Fault over here. We have a west dipping central range fault over here, and we have something or the UD fault in uh, be in between these two faults. And at that at that time, we didn't know uh, what this UD fault related to. Is that part of the eastern system or part of the western system? We actually didn't know. So again, what is the relationship between these 
September earthquake, uh, uh, September 2022 earthquake series, uh, the surface rupture of this earthquake, and these three different thoughts. So uh, as Erica was mentioned that uh, uh, there, are, there are two earthquakes. So the four shock uh, was in September 17, and the uh, main shock was in September uh, 18th. Both of them actually show very clearly uh, northeast, southwest striking, and uh, west dipping fault plan. So by seeing this west dipping fault plan and the location of these two faults, we clearly know that this, this, these two earthquakes are not related to this red line, this longitudinal valley fault system. Uh, it looks like part of the central range fault uh, um, rupture. However, when we go out to the field, we actually didn't see any surface rupture along this blue line. Instead, if we blow up this area, we can see that uh, these three red lines are the three faults that I mentioned earlier, uh, the Longitudinal Valley Fault, the Central Range Fault, and the UD Fault in the middle. And then turn out that the surface rupture of this earthquake was all along this UD Fault and matching the historical documents very, very well. The blue are the uh, uh, location of uh, documented surface ruptures by our team. And, it, and you can see that it's almost perfectly matching the uh, historically documented UD fault, which is the surface rupture of 1951. So uh, let's take a look uh, in, uh, at some of these surface ruptures. So north of the UD town, we can see this very nicely left laterally offset uh, uh, running track along this uh, uh, um, field. And then inside the UD town, where the 1951 historical documents are very, very well and very well documented, we can see that uh, these two surface ruptures are matching the uh, 1951 rupture almost perfectly from the north in the uh, uh, UD old UD elementary school to the south in the uh, roundabout of uh, near the central uh, town center of UD. Uh, both of these places have very well documented the historical uh, record of 1951. And again, uh, the surface rupture of this earthquake are matching the historical document very well. At the uh, northern end of the UD fault, we also see surface rupture of this uh, 2022 uh, earthquake. So for example, there are offset of the uh, um, divide of the uh, rice paddies. There are also some left lateral offset of the uh, um, uh, concrete uh, wall of this ditch, and also some more uh, offset along these um, um, rice paddy divides and so on. So, uh, the interesting thing is that this earthquake, the surface rupture, not only along the uh, uh, originally mapped uh, UD fault, and it, it actually extended further to the south, to this area. And it, it's in this area that we finally uh, get some more information about this so-called UD fault. So here, we actually, not only we can see the uh, very clear left lateral offset, along this watermelon field, we also see uh, vertical movement as well. So here we can, we can see that other than left lateral offset of the surface rupture, we also see the vertical movement showing that the western side is coming up. So again, here we, we clearly see an example of uh, both the vertical movement and the uh, left lateral movement all together along the surface rupture. And with the western side coming up, we finally know that the, the UD fault is actually part of the central range fault system. So the UD fault is actually a branch of the central range fault system. All right. So other than the uh, surface rupture along the UD fault, you probably also hear that along the longitudinal valley fault uh, line, there are also a lot of uh, surface ruptures. Yes, there are a lot of small induced surface ruptures along almost the entire southern part of the Longitudinal Valley Fault. From the very, very north, this is a small 
uh, formation and rupture uh, uh, that um, move, uh, deform this uh, uh, ground of this house uh, to the central part, small ruptures along the uh, longitudinal uh, valley fault, and to all the way to the very, very south of the longitudinal valley fault that we also see a small uh, uh, surface rupture there. So the clearly things is that they are all small uh, from several centimeters to uh, less than 20 centimeters. So what are the relationships of all these faults and all these surface ruptures? In fact, uh, in 2006, I proposed a model of these two fault systems, the longitudinal valley fault system and the central range fault system. Because the uh, collision of, uh, of the uh, uh, coastal range of Taiwan and the central range of Taiwan, so these two faults cannot propagate uh, uh, further to the front like, nor, uh, like a general fault that usually uh, when they grow, they propagate uh, further to the front. Um, because the collision, there is no space for them to propagate to the front. So instead, they actually propagate to, to above. So, so becoming uh, this kind of shallower uh, level of structures. So I propose this, uh, we call it Christmas tree um, uh, model for these two structures. So it turned out that uh, this, this earthquake is showing this, uh, uh, this kind of geometry. So here we actually have this uh, uh, current, we call it current central range fault uh, line, which did not rupture the, uh, this time. Instead, it lower a lower level of the central range fault, probably uh, ruptured this time with a a uh, shallow branch uh, that cut all the way to the surface. And this is actually the Yuli fault that we, we call them. And then it's actually part of a, 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 sh a shallow branch of the central range fault system. And then because of the movement on the central range fault uh, in the deeper part, it actually uh, affected the uh, longitudinal valley fault system. So there are induced sleep on the longitudinal valley fault due to this deeper branch of the central range fault. So this, so basically this is how everything goes uh, during this earthquake and the structural characteristics of this area. So with that, um, I'll conclude here and happy to uh, answer questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chu for the excellent presentation. Um, again, any questions, you can refer to the, the Q&A section, to this Q&A panel uh, with the link located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, like I said, if there's time at the end, we'll be able to answer some of these questions. I So again, be sure to uh, be uh, uh, writing your questions as we go through the presentations. Um, we'll go on to the next uh, presentation on emergency management. And we have the pleasure of having with us uh, Dr. Wei Sen Li, who is a Secretary General of the National Science and Technology Center for Disaster Reduction in Taiwan. Um, uh, well, so welcome, uh, Dr. Li, and I'll uh, hand it over to you. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for organizer to invite me to share uh, our experience during the uh, 9th, uh, 18th earthquake in 2022. I'm going to share my slides. Yeah, can everyone see my slide? Okay, um, yes. thanks for the... Uh, uh, Erica and the professor should give the, some introduction about the earthquake happened last year. Uh, my major point of my presentation is focused on emergency response. I'm recently Secretary General of the National Science and Technology Center for Disaster Reduction. Actually, my office has very spe special role under the National Science and Technology Council. Our major mission is how to apply science and technology for the uh, for the uh, emerging response and disaster risk reduction. So we have a lot of the partners, no matter in Taiwan, even EI is one of partner for the ICUDR. And we provide a lot of service and product. One of the product is emerging response, but we are not helpful for the uh, search and rescue operation. This is the framework of Taiwan of disaster risk uh, 
uh, management, especially at central level, you can see NCDR play a role no matter for disaster risk reduction kind of the advisory uh, secretarial to central government in case of emergency NCDI will also join the emergency operation together with other government agency in case of typhoon, flood or earthquake. And NCDI have the role, see that this is director of the, my office. When we have situation, no matter earthquake or typhoon, we have to use the science and technology to give a briefing to premier or the a uh, minister of interior, even when our president visited the EOC, NCDI have to brief about impact. So major function of NCDI in case of emergency, we try to give the clear idea about impact. So this is our office doing. Actually, my office is in the same building with our uh, national central emergency operating center, which in the third and fourth floor. In case of emergency like earthquake, NCDI will chair one meeting in EOC and also join with other government agency to deliver some report. And this is very important uh, under the uh, uh, urgency like earthquake or typhoon. NCDI is chair of situation assessment group. Uh, actually, this framework is copy idea from the FEMA emergency support function ESF. NCDI have to work with a lot of government agency together to understand the impact, to tell about some uh, assessment. So NCDI will work with so many agencies. Of course, among them, Central Weather Bureau is very important to my office. They provide a lot of parameters, including uh, earthquake quick report, so we can do some uh, risk assessment. So very important thing, how NCDI provide impact assessment to the central government, because we have already integrated a lot of big data set from over 40 government agency, no matter from the geological profile, uh, traffic situation, even later I will tell about the population distribution, especially near real time population distribution. This is help us understand when the earthquake hit, where are the people, are they safe or not? So we can easily answer the question by our big data set. So very important thing, NCDI try to create a kind of environment through kind of integration, different kind of sensor. We can provide a suggestion, especially recorded information intelligence to citizen or decision maker. So we call it kind of DRR, disaster risk reduction information supply chain. Actually, we will through the following channel first about open data. Actually, we already have about 59 open data in Taiwan share with the different uh, user, including some app developer or some private sector. Or we share data with the Google on Google map right now. If any alert, you can check on your Google map, even when you're walking or driving. And the third channel is very important. Likewise, in the United States under the FEMA, NCDI also part of McKinney in Taiwan to disseminate kind of the recorded cell broadcast service on cell phone. Actually, on the uh, September eight, uh, uh, September 17th and 18th, NCD helped to deliver several uh, CBS alert on uh, uh, user cell phone, no matter in Hualien, Taidong, or Yilan. And another very important thing, like uh, how to increase the coverage, another additional channel in recent years, we use the line, which is very popular, uh, Earth uh, instant messenger. So if any earthquake happen, we also will pop up kind of the very clear and show the message to the user who subscribe our services. So this is our improvement. We provide some the profile. We provide some uh, loss estimation system. We provide CBS and very important thing, we try to use a lot of big data. So everything, five minutes after earthquake, NCDI will provide this, the three charts to general public or to government agency. And the, for the previous two is to the pop, uh, pop general public. The last one is tell about situation about science park, which is very important to the National Science and Technology Council who supervise the science park, especially like the semiconductor industrial uh, dense located in the science parks. And it will also provide the, a lot of geological profile. This is our recent product. We use tectonic uh, structure identify location of hypercenter and the uh, recent uh, earthquakes. And very important right now, we will try to use the 3D model. Actually, we already use this in EOC. And a very important part, how to know the impact when earthquake hit. We collaborate with the mobile phone company. 
we use this, the, we call it dynamic population distribution to understand like in the degree about 500 meter by 500 meter every 10 minutes, how many mobile phone users in the degree. So this help us to understand when the earthquake hit the previous 10 minutes, the where the people were. And about operation of the foreshock and uh, and the major shock, pre-shock and aftershock last year. Actually, for the pre-shock, NCD are already stand by the EOC. Want to know about situation? Help the emergency responder at EOC to uh, check out all the disaster hotspot. Later on September 18th, immediately after earthquake, about 10 minutes, NCD are already operate at the COC, national kind of national level emergency operation center. And we already delivered a report to like, you see this gentleman, uh, he uh, is the former minister of interior. And when the premier visit the EOC, NCD also used our information to explain the situation and impact assessment to top decision maker. And even when president visit EOC, NCD also tell them about our uh, impact assessment. So see, this is how NCD operate. Uh, right after earthquake, and we operate about uh, almost uh, two days, one point half days. This is how NCD joint emergency operation. I will give the short example, what kind of information we deliver at EOC. You can see first, we still uh, highlight about the hypercenter and the geological profile. Actually, this profile, we have teamwork with the NTU and the Geological Survey Bureau in Taiwan. We try to highlight the uh, the uh, geological profile and structure of the earthquake, especially we try to uh, tell about situation of the aftershocks. And we also like the, what the uh, professor should mention. We want to identify and tell the commander whatever happened before, and what is the possible mechanism of earthquake? At that time, we already think it's Central Ridge Fort, which caused this uh, uh, earthquake. And we also tell the trend of aftershock collect data from the Central Weather Bureau to tell them this is the, for the uh, pre-shock, this is about after the main, major shock. How about the, the number of the uh, aftershock happens? And the most important, things we highlight about the, the, the impact. So we'll collect a lot of the report, no matter from the, uh, the fire department or from the crowdsourcing like Facebook, we try to highlight possible high, uh, impact and give kind of situation map to the commander in the EOC to do some the emergency response. And a very important thing we have to highlight how many people still trapped in the mountainous area, for example, there are several locations like uh, uh, some the tourists trapped in the mountains. So we have to update the situation and to tell, uh, tell uh, work with other government agencies to integrate report uh, to tell the commander what's his current situation. And of course, in another location in uh, Hualing about some tourists also trapped in the mountainous area. So the, the concluding part of my slide, uh, not like the uh, entry, not like the school professor, they focus on mechanism or kind of the seismic design after earth earthquake. Our job is try to highlight the impact and to guide the top decision maker to conduct some emerging response based on scientific evidence. So we, our operation model is from the uh, scientific prediction or models. Then we will have a lot of the real time monitoring, like we received the uh, uh, highway uh, image or some uh, sensor like P alert, even some information from the entry. But most important thing, we have to help to make the in time decision, especially we call it a science based decision. So this is how we succeed. So I think everyone know about the model D I K W data information knowledge and wisdom, but NCD at another very important to the uh, DIKW, we call it A, we call it action, because all our information focus on Asian action. We focus on how to inform the general public and decision maker to take some action to prepare to, to protect their life. And I think the key element to succeed kind of emergency operation, very important thing, we have to integrate all kinds of different uh, sciences like my office, we have all different kind of the background. And we need the, uh, a public-private partnership, like the, the cell phone signal is from the 
uh, phone companies, the big data from the uh, private sector. And most importantly, we need kind of global partnership like EI to work on some agenda about earthquake engineering and try to reduce the earthquake. This is my uh, sharing about how we conduct emergent response for the earthquake hit last year. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee. That's very, uh, very insightful. Uh, we had a, a few questions coming, but again, we're going to save all questions uh, for the end. We're, we're open to have at least 10 minutes uh, before uh, the, the end of the session to try to answer some of those uh, questions. So we'll um, move forward to the next presentation. We're doing very good on time, so I think we should have time uh, at the end for that. Um, and our next uh, uh, speaker is Ben Mason, uh, who's going to talk on the ge geotechnical aspects of earth earthquake. Um, Dr. Mason is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Construction Engineering at Oregon State University and a research civil engineer at the United States Geological Survey's Geological Hazard Science Center. He's a member of the Geotechnical Extreme, Extreme Events Reconnaissance Gear Association. Uh, Dr. Mason, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, thank everybody online for your time today to join and, and hear about the uh, earthquakes or earthquake in Taiwan. Uh, I was a co-leader of the Geoengineering Extreme Events Reconnaissance Team, along with Dominiki Asamaki, who I think is also on the call today. Um, and so I do want to just talk about some of our initial observations. Before I get into that, uh, the acknowledgments, I should say partial acknowledgments list. Of course, we all are grateful uh, for David Frost, who is the chairperson of the GEAR Association now, as well as GEAR for supporting our efforts. The support largely comes from the National Science Foundation. We have uh, an incredible number of people to think from INCRE and I'd say uh, other universities, but INCRE was our main organization that we uh, collaborated with and they put us in contact with most of our in-country collaborators. Uh, it would not have been possible uh, the U.S. Geological Survey uh, was very gracious uh, and supported some of my time. Finally, the, the people of Taiwan for just being extremely welcoming to us during the recon effort. You'll see a core group of our team, including the, the U.S.-based gear team, as well as some of our Taiwanese collaborators that helped drive us around and uh, talk to us about the geology and geotechnical engineering. Uh, because we're on an EERI call, and I, I know I saw on the participants list a lot of structural engineering colleagues, I thought I would maybe talk about the GEAR Association just for a minute. Uh, I would recommend going to gearassociation.org. I've been very fortunate, first as a recorder when I was a graduate student, and then uh, participating on four GEAR-related reconnaissance activities since then. And it's really shaped my career, how I think about problems. Uh, but I think more than that, it's uh, helped me gain a lot of empathy and, and the big picture perspective for why our field is important uh, and, and it helps significantly with motivation. So for younger folks on the call, I would recommend checking out gear or also I know STEER is the structural engineering equivalent. And I would highly recommend checking them out, too. OK, so why do we go over there? One of the first uh, things we did, we got together as a group and we uh, we tried to collate as much information as possible. The VERT report was uh, very fundamental for us, but also INCRE had produced a very quick field report, too. And so between those two reports, as well as talking to colleagues in country, uh, talking to colleagues, say, at the USGS, looking at social media sites like Twitter, we piece together, okay, th these are the topics or the large topics that we're gonna think are gonna be the most important from a geotechnical engineering perspective. Uh, so strong pulse-like earthquake motions, we had the shallow crustal motion, uh, the epicenter was very close to this valley where we saw the, the damage. Uh, surface fault rupture, as as you've already seen Bruce talk about, 
uh, soil structure interaction, in particular, I would say the bridges that cross the river through through the valley, uh, landslides and rock falls. I should mention, and then uh, we did interestingly see very limited to you you could call it no surface manifestations of liquefaction, which we found very interesting. Uh, you've already seen these maps from our previous presenters. It's uh, a PGA, or sorry, a PGV, peak ground velocity map. Again, just highlighting the fact that even before we went to Taiwan, just looking at the USGS shake map, uh, we, we had an idea, right? We're going to see some near feel. We're going to see some pulse-like motions. We're going to see these directivity effects. And you see this contour of 50 centimeters per second right in the main part of that valley. And uh, in fact, we're, we're seeing earthquake motions that are, are quite a bit above those PGVs uh, as we're starting to look station by station. What's interesting, when you look at this valley, the, you've got a large river that, that runs through the center of the valley. That's not atypical. Um, and then this part of Taiwan is very dynamic, very wet, a lot of rainfall. So you have a, a alluvial plain, uh, an area that floods over and over again. So certainly before we went there, just looking at this, this map, we would have thought there's going to be a lot more liquefaction uh, than actually occurred. Okay, so we... We have started uh, with the help of our, our colleagues in Taiwan to process some of the earthquake motions that were recorded. I will say you know, I went to Nepal in 2015 and Indonesia in 2018. And one issue there is that we did not have many, if at any, uh, reliable earthquake motion recordings. And so in terms of understanding the geological phenomenon, you know, we were kind of flying blind, so to speak. But fortunately in Taiwan, we have the opposite situation because of the strong, well-kept, well-funded seismic networks, we're able to get a lot of earthquake motions. And so uh, our hope as, as we continue to work on this as a team and with our Taiwanese, Taiwanese uh, collaborators, that we're gonna be able to correlate some of the geotechnical damage that we saw to these earthquake motions. So we got four networks from the, if you want to consider it the main shock, the 6.9, we've got 32 stations in the general area of, of uh, uh, Southeast Taiwan. And then the four shock the day before the 6.5, we got 45 recordings. Very importantly, I think for our uh, earthquake motion database worldwide in general, 20 or sorry, 34 of those recordings from the main shock occurred uh, in a, with a hypocentral distance of less than 25 kilometers. So that's giving us very critical information that we need for say uh, ground motion prediction equations, uh, et cetera. So uh, the, the team is busy processing motions, trying to understand the forward directivity, the existence of velocity pulses, being careful with the signal processing, uh, maybe more difficult or definitely more difficult, also understanding the permanent tectonic offset that is happening at these stations and then val validating that with the GNSS um, network. And then finally, the, the general processing, getting it into a peer framework, calculating various intensity measures, et cetera. So if we look at this a little bit more in detail, we're, we're trying to come up with these uh, PGV direction maps, and we're trying to understand in particular velocity time series uh, all throughout this valley at the, the different stations. And why, for instance, we see a strong one-sided velocity pulse, say at this first station that we highlight, uh, but you know we see a two-sided strong velocity pulse at the second station that we highlighted. And of course, in the third station, we would expect no or minimal velocity pulses because of the, the backward directivity. 
uh, surface fault rupture. And so you heard, a, I'd say, a much more comprehensive examination of this from Bruce earlier. Uh, but our team was very interested in it as well. We brought a geomorphologist with us into the field, uh, Brian Gray, who had also done his master's thesis work in this valley. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time also going throughout the entire valley, starting uh, from above, trying to look at NSAR data and, and see what we could piece together, I would say, from the, the macro scale and then zooming in to what you might call maybe the drone scale, which is what I'm showing on the right. And so we can we can try to start establishing features at the drone scale too. And then finally getting down to maybe what you might call the human scale. I really like this photo. Uh, it, it reminds me of a finite element mesh. And so you can see on the left, the original mesh and you can see the displaced shape of that mesh. And so we can take some careful measurements at that human scale. The idea is that we are then going to integrate the human scale with what we learned uh, at the drone scale with what we're then learning at the uh, satellite or the NSAR scale. Uh, so a lot of work to do, similar findings to, to what Bruce presented earlier general left lateral uh, movement, movements on the order of 10 to 90 centimeters um, in many places, but a lot more work to accomplish here. And so kind of transitioning to the next topic, which is the soil bridge interaction. This is another surface fault rupture picture though. And so from the drone scale, we're able to map the surface fault rupture quite complicated, but we also have this bridge approach here, and this bridge was highly damaged due to the earthquake. So we wanted to know uh, why. And so our bridges throughout the valley, the one thing that we saw initially, we said, well, it must be liquefaction, but there was no evidence, no surface manifestations of liquefaction, including uh, observations from our Taiwanese colleagues who were in the field you know, the day after this earthquake occurred. And so um, we, we found that very interesting in trying to explain the bridge damage. So if we do move now to the bridge damage, uh, on the left, you see a bridge that was, even though it spanned the uh, large river channel, no evidence of liquefaction. We suspect in this case, this was due to a strong velocity pulse that the bridge probably could not handle. And then on the right, you see another bridge, the Galileo Bridge, which uh, again, pretty significant uh, velocity pulse approaching 100 centimeters per second. Uh, but also at this bridge, right, we've, uh, or at all of these bridges on top of these strong velocity pulses, which are adding significant demand, we have these fling effects, right? We have the permanent fault offset, kind of like I showed in the, the previous slide. And then that's what our team working on the earthquake motion reduction and processing is trying to figure out too. So, so it's a big picture of why these bridges were, were damaged. Here is some high quality drone footage from our drone team. We did notice on the bridge uh, approach, this is the Galileo bridge that we showed previously, uh, we noticed that the retaining walls on either side of the bridge approach had, had failed. And so this might be a very interesting case of a uh, passive seismic failure. So some opportunities there. Uh, finally, from a technical uh, perspective, from a ground failure or, or point of view, the landslides, honestly, it was hard to separate the signal from the noise. This part of Taiwan is maybe one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, but to be that beautiful, it has to be a little bit dangerous. And so landslides occur every single day there. there. And in fact, the one I'm showing here blocked the road on the way that we are going to view another landslide that we knew had been caused by the earthquake shaking. Now, what I do think is promising, or what we do think is promising, 
are slow creeping landslides. And so just like um, here in Seattle today, but just like the Pacific Northwest, the coastal range, you've got these uh, slow moving landslides, largely dominated by gravity or as, as well as rain. But occasionally you're going to have these large earthquakes and that's going to destabilize it perhaps a little bit further. So I do think there's an opportunity here using both the drone imagery as well as LIDAR flown on drones to make some contributions in this field. So some, some brief conclusions, right? We have a real opportunity here because we did not see much liquefaction to, uh, I would say, calibrate our remote sensing tools to, to perhaps uh, spot areas where you would suspect there's gonna be liquefaction, but we don't see any. That's gonna be a very hard or tall order. And uh, so I look forward to seeing others work on this topic. A liquefaction or the lack thereof during short pulse-like motions. I think there's an opportunity here based on our observations. Uh, seismic design codes, particularly bridges and areas of the US that are gonna span active faults or be nearby active faults. We do have an opportunity to learn from this event. Uh, the recording density I mentioned earlier, uh, so many seismic stations. So we have a real opportunity to correlate some of these earthquake motion parameters with the geotechnical damage that we saw. A lot of legs to, to run in the geomorphology field, particularly with the surface fault rupture. And finally, uh, Buka Noweke uh, from USC came with us. He did do some ambient vibration test and uh, him and his students are working very hard on that data which is difficult to resolve, but we do look forward to sharing that eventually after we can make more sense of it. Final slide, we have a forthcoming technical breakthrough abstract in the Geotech Journal. So I'm hoping that will appear online very shortly. We're working hard on the GEAR report, which will be freely available and DOI'd on the gearassociation.org website. I'm sure we'll be announcing that to listservs uh, we have a forthcoming gear uh, webinar, the dates to be determined. We have a series of SSA annual meeting talks and so on and so forth. And so I encourage you to reach out to any of us if you're interested in more information. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mason, uh, for, the, for the insight and for sharing your insights during your, your trip here. Um, we have one, um, one, one more speaker, uh, last, but um, but not least is uh, uh, Dr. Chang Chen Cho, who's a director a general of the National Center for Research on Earthquake Engineering in Taiwan, and the president of the Chinese Taiwan Society for Earthquake Engineering. And uh, as um, as you saw from uh, heard earlier, this uh, seminar is organized jointly by ERI and Enqri. So thank you, Dr. Cho, for um, for your participation in the organization of the seminar. Um, and I'll hand it over to you for your presentation on the structural aspects. Thank you. Uh, let me share my file. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to say uh, thank you to the ERI and uh, Gilberto, Erica, to organize uh, this uh, webinar, uh, go through the, the earthquake happened uh, last year in Taiwan. Uh, we call the Guansan and the Chishan earthquakes uh, based on our government. Uh, I am the director of the National Center for Research on Earthquake Engineering and also the professor of civil engineering at the National Taiwan University. So before I go to the, these two earthquakes, I would like to use two slides to uh, introduce you the, the ANCRI. Uh, ANCRI is a national center in Taiwan for doing the uh, research on earthquake engineering. So we have the five meter, five meter shaking table in the Taipei lab. And uh, we used it to come do some small scale structure testing and uh, the contest uh, for the uh, high school students or undergraduate students every year, particularly in September. Uh, uh, we uh, invite all the young people to come to Taiwan uh, to do this uh, contest with us uh, uh, each year. Then we also have a 15 meter to six, six meter high reaction wall. So we can use this reaction wall to do static, dynamic, also hybrid simulation testing. 
we also have also have the uh, facility called the MATS, which can pro provide uh, uh, more than 5,000 kilonewton actual load uh, plus the horizontal load 400 uh, kilonewton. So on the bottom, you can see uh, the another facility in our Titan lab. So we have uh, a meter by a meter the shaking table with the capacity uh, long stroke one meter. Uh, PG it can reach uh, 2G and also high velocity pulse to 100 centimeter per second. So we used to use this table to do some collaboration research with international people. This is two examples. One uh, is uh, research work with the uh, New Zealand quick core. Uh, so you can see uh, we built a, a seven story half scale the reinforced concrete to investigate the torsion effect on the bottom floor wall. And uh, we also use uh, uh, the second one is uh, uh, steel brace frame. So we collaborate with uh, UC San Diego, uh, University of Arlington in the US, and also the National Chengdong University, Taiwan University, to study the rigid slab, or, uh, sliding slab on the seismic resistance, resistance of the frame. So we also have a device to do in the bearing test. In addition to that, so our government now is uh, uh, trying very hard to use the green energy to uh, supply electricity to Taiwan. So uh, before 2035, we would like to have a 20 gigawatt green energy, particularly from the wind turbine. So we uh, plan to uh, erect more than uh, thousands of wind turbine along the West Coast. So if you don't know where is Taiwan, uh, this is a map you can see the China on the west side of the Taiwan Island over here. Uh, on the north, we have Japan, Korea. On the south, we have Philippines. So in the Taiwan, the, the two uh, uh, junction of the uh, plants. So we have many earthquakes happen every year. So you can each dot represent the epicenter of the uh, earthquake during the uh, last uh, 50 years. And we also have a lot of faults along the Taiwan Island because uh, we are trying to build the uh, wind turbine on, along the west coast. So the turbine will also suffer the, uh, not just the typhoon and also the public soil structure interaction and so on. So we get the support from the, our Ministry of Science and Technology for 30 million US dollars uh, to have a project to do the research on the wind turbine. Uh, in this uh, project, so we are trying to be the new lab, the third lab in Taiwan. So we will have the uh, 480 G ton uh, 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 central field. So we can study the deep water soil property. We also have, we'll build the, the lab to study the, uh, the wind black uh, behavior, particularly in the static dynamic and fatigue behavior. In Taiwan, as you know, there are too many earthquakes so uh, our government has placed more than thousands uh, accelerometer along the island. So each uh, dot represents the accelerometer belonging to different agencies. So our central builder Vero can use those accelerometer build, build the EWS early warning system. So this is one of the example. Uh, you can see the epicenter happens here. Then uh, in the nearby region, so we have around uh, three, uh, to six seconds uh, early warning. But uh, uh, beyond this point, so we have more than like four, uh, 10 to 28 seconds in the urban uh, city area. So that gives uh, our people uh, the time uh, to, do, to leave the building or bridge. In addition to that, we also have the uh, early, uh, so-called uh, early uh, SNM machine loss system, we call the TELUS. So after we receive the uh, epicenter of uh, earthquake magnitude, location, and the soil properties, so we'll be able to estimate the loss. So this is one of the example. You can see uh, after this earthquake happens, in seven minutes, we can get this message uh, showing the uh, initial estimation of the loss. So based on analysis, we have more than this analysis, we get the more than uh, hundreds of building damages uh, spread in the Yili, Shisang, uh, and the Fuli area, and uh, some people will be uh, endangered. Therefore, 
on the second day, so we launched the team uh, to the epicenter area. So Enqui has uh, launched four teams. Uh, one is building, bridge team. Gilberto was in Enqui at the right time. So uh, he joined us to go to the site. Uh, we also have a landslide team, non-structure team. And we also have people working on the ground motion to digest those uh, data uh, in the fault area. So we uh, published the uh, early report in our website and also ER website. We will try very hard uh, to come up with a report in early this year so people can, uh, researcher can see what's going on, uh, this earthquake happened. So uh, I just uh, want to share you some uh, information. So we pull out the uh, accelerometer along the fault. So we can see uh, clearly the fault directive effect, for example, near the epicenter uh, region. So this is a velocity info uh, history. So you can see the pulse uh, uh, magnitude is around 90 centimeter per second uh, along the fault, particularly at the end of the Cixan fault. Uh, uh, the magnitude can increase to 120 uh, centimeter per second. Uh, so it's parallel to the fault movement. So then uh, as long as with this high velocity pulse, for example, uh, Galileo Bridge is also just at the end of the fault region. So we uh, get the spectral acceleration. Uh, so blue line represents the uh, acceleration spectra. Uh, the light blue represents the older code value uh, in Taiwan. So you can see this ground motion produces uh, more than two times uh, uh, larger demand uh, for those uh, bridges uh, designed uh, in old days. And the black line represents the current demand, uh, design demand uh, from our code. So you can see that's within a tolerable, tolerable range. And then when we go a little bit south, that's here along the Sisan Fault, so that's the uh, Yuli Bridge. So you can look at this uh, map, see the Yuli Bridge basically across uh, uh, some fault. So we get the ground acceleration uh, magnitude, which is about similar to the one uh, in the Galileo Bridge, a little bit north. And uh, for this bridge, you can see the photo on the bottom. So we see the, the shear key failure. Unfortunately, the shear key stops the folding of the superstructure. And we also see the collision between the two superstructure deck. Then we go a little bit south to the Rentian Bridge, which is also very close to the Cixan Fold, uh, six, uh, around six meters on the east coast, on the east end. So you can see the ground acceleration at this near the location is very high. It's more than probably three or four times higher than the code design value, uh, which is represented by the light blue. So then what's going on to this Rentian Bridge? Uh, you can see from this uh, slide, and uh, this bridge was very old, 40 years old. So at that time, we don't have any seism seismic design guideline in Taiwan. So we see, uh, we don't see the shear key to stop the uh, folding of superstructure. And uh, we see the, the column uh, tilting, uh, but, and also the clean car, it is the interface between the column and the Tyson foundation. Here you can see the longitudinal reinforcement is very small and uh, there is no transverse reinforcement in so-called plastic hinge region or the bottom of the column. And uh, that's why it probably causes this very low fracture capacity of the column, uh, which cannot take this uh, uh, high uh, seismic force. We go to the Galileo Bridge uh, you from the, the damaged column, so we measure the spacing of the hoop. Uh, it's uh, around uh, uh, 35 to 40 centimeter, uh, which is pretty large. It's not allowed in the current seismic design code. Uh, we see uh, a little bit larger bar size, longitudinal re reinforcement bar size, but uh, we see the, all the uh, longitudinal reinforcement uh, overlap at the same height, which probably is, which is not good, cause, also cause this collapse. On the other end of 
breach, we see a little bit closer spacing. So the column did not get a shear failure, but we also see a tilting of the column. So, so this failure more is a little bit than the what we observe in the uh, uh, GGS earthquake. You can see very clear shear failure in GGS earthquake. But this, for this very old bridge, we see a clean car at the interface between the column and the foundation. We also see a weak story uh, collapse in the GG earthquake. For example, the three story becomes second story. The first story uh, has a, a significant column shear failure. We also see this damage in the building school. So we see a similar behavior uh, this time. So you can see a collapse of uh, a seven-story build, uh, the uh, three-story building, which has a very wide opening first story. Uh, on the the other building at the end of this system uh, so this is a building before collapse. This is a building after the collapse. So we can see the first story column punching uh, through the second story slab, and from the damaged column, we can see the very small size of a uh, transverse reinforcement, and the spacing is also very large. So on the building next to the uh, collapse one, uh, we see the column shear failure. But the, uh, fortunately, this building uh, did not collapse because there's a masonry wall next to this uh, uh, column. So after the GG earthquake, the angry did a lot of testing. So for example, this is one of the testing column. There's all, only longitudinal reinforcement without any transverse reinforcement. So when we do the testing, you can see once the column reaches a shear capacity, it just uh, uh, the force just a uh, uh, drop. Uh, there's no any ductility. We also did a school building testing. So for example, in huge uh, building testing, we try to uh, get the capacity of this uh, old building in Taiwan. So the building uh, probably collapsed at about two percent drift. So we use those motions uh, collected from this ground uh, earthquake. So we analyze the three stories, eight story, and also the 14 story reinforced concrete building. We see the demand to this building is very small, uh, particularly uh, except for this high rise building because the high velocity part with high period, uh, probably close to the uh, high rise building. But for the low rise building, the drift demand is pretty low. Therefore, uh, we dig into that. So for example, uh, we designed this based on the current call, the case A, the building performed very well. If we reduce the seismic design force to the old code, uh, to the B case, C case, we see the drift demand is increased, but the increase that is not too much, uh, will not cause a building collapse. But however, if we include in the shear failure in the first story column, here you can see a CS case, then you will see the very high drift at the first story, 2.5% drift, larger than the capacity of the building. So we also use one of the ground motion collected from UD to do some risk, to do some shaking type of testing. At the that time, we have the one project going on with the San Diego UTA. And so uh, we built this three-story building uh, using the, uh, uh, the record collected from the Susan earthquake. So we use a uh, uh, so-called BRB, uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, seismic resistance. This BRB has a call to take an actual force resending member to provide the later support. Uh, so we are in, do the testing, for example, the phase two, we have bump up this ground acceleration from the uh, 0.031 G to the 0.98 G. So we get to the maximum drift is about uh, 3%. So this is one of the video, probably you can see uh, the maximum PGA is about 0.9 AG. Uh, the record is from the uh, Chishan earthquake. You can see this building, this uh, demand is almost two or three times larger than the uh, size, uh, current design target. But the building can uh, stands over there uh, without the collapse. So it means if we design based on the current code, it should be okay. So I just have a few slides to say uh, to conclude my talk. Uh, so basically, this design, this demand is very high, and the building is uh, the bridge is old. We see some uh, column failure and the clean cut to the interface of the column and Kesson foundation in the rural area. Probably two column bands should be better than the one single column band substructure. 
啊、uh, ，the period was 呃，吃上 coke has 啊啊 velocity pulse period more than the two seconds, which is larger than the 呃、uh, low rise building period. So that did not cause too much collapse of the low rise building. And for the non such a、uh, non ductile uh reinforced concrete, uh, uh it may reach a two percent drift cause of shear failure. Uh, I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you for your listening. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chu, for the presentation. Um, we have a, a a few minutes for questions. So again, if you have any questions, uh, be sure to use the Q and A session. Uh, uh, of uh, there's a, a link down at the bottom of your screen, and write any questions there, and we'll we could try to take some of these questions live. We have about seven minutes left in our scheduled uh time, ending uh, ending on the half hour. Um. So um. I think the first question was uh, for uh, right after Erica's、uh, presentation, but maybe it's also something that that、uh, Bruce can answer. And I don't know if we can show a, a fault rupture. We have time for that, but at least provide a, a, some guidance for Andres Felipe Alonso Rodriguez was asking on on、um, something on the fault rupture、uh, to show the fault rupture shape.、Um, I think we'll try to maybe answer that question、uh, with the link to more information. Um, and also, yeah.、Uh, can we get all the, all the speakers back online with、uh, cameras? Okay, we have a question for、um, from Jeff Rubin, and、uh, this is for.、Uh, I think it's also during Erica's presentation, or could it could also be answered by uh, uh, Dr. Cho. Were the were the damaged bridges carrying other lifelines, and so how do they fare? Can you see the question, Erica or or, or、um, Dr. Cho on?、Um, well, I think the question's gone.、Um, yeah,、uh, the question was: Was there any lifelines along the bridges, and、uh, was there any damage to those? Oh yes, I can answer these questions. Yeah, there is only one life,、uh, one people、uh, killed during this、uh, bridge damage. Mm-hmm. Because the bridge was、uh, built in very rural area, so not many people are、uh, mm-hmm. using this bridge.、Uh, yeah. Also,、uh, along that same line, I mean, there was a bridge. I can't remember which one it was, but there was a, a I think, a, a water line rupture on, I think, one of the first bridges we visited that shut down water to the、um, to a community. Yes.、Um, so yeah, cer- certainly some of that damage, and we'll hope to document more of that within the within the reports. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Doug Neiman,、uh, and、uh, this is for、uh, Doctor Shu, I believe.、Um, were you able to infer fault normal displacements across the Yuli Fault?、Uh, yes, uh, I think uh,、um, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, the uh, northern the the northern part of the Yuli Fault,、uh, we didn't actually see a lot of the、uh, fault normal displacement, mostly、uh, left lateral,、uh, pretty much similar to the、uh, situation of 1951. However, only along the、uh, southern segment, like I mentioned, the uh, uh, near the so-called watermelon field, that we clearly see、uh, vertical displacement. So the、uh, fault normal uh, uh, displacement is、uh, quite clear along that. That part of the surface rupture and the、uh, maximum vertical、uh, offset can be、uh, well. The the maximum、uh, is about one meter、uh, with、uh, western side moving up. So、uh, that's that's、uh, quite clear along that that side that we can see the、uh, um, um, fault normal displacement. Okay.、Uh, thank you. We also have a question from.、Uh... Teresa Elliott on,、uh, and this I believe would be for Dr. Lee.、Uh, does Taiwan use the same type of information technology recovery, or just for emergency response? Because my office shop covered all phases of、uh, a disaster risk management, so we also apply the same information technology for recovery. For example, not just collect about、uh, a physical vulnerability. Uh, after the earthquake, also conduct kind of the social vulnerability、uh, survey to understand impact in the affected area, and we will do kind of comparison study with the neighborhood area we suffer less damage because we want to know the 
risk perception of the people, especially in the affected area. So we'll cover the whole phases of disaster risk management. So yes, we do for both. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Lee. And this, I think, question also for um, for you. Uh, can you explain cross sourcing? And is that mostly Facebook or Twitter, or what what else do you use for that? Uh, first of all, Twitter is not so popular in Taiwan. So our one of our major source is from the uh, Facebook. And in Taiwan, <clears throat> we also have other platform that people will post like text, picture, even video to the website. So my office has collaboration with several platforms. So we agreed to take some public information and we highlight the source and we highlight who contribute the source, uh, the, the, no matter picture or image. So we'll try to use the different crowdsourcing in case no matter about typhoon or the earthquake, because sometimes crowdsourcing is faster than the official channel, but we have to take care about some uh, uh, force news because some people will uh, post uh, what happened before. So we try to screen out some forest news. So this is how we uh, use the crowdsourcing in case of emergency. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, we have, uh, the next question is from Fred Turner, and this could be to uh, any of our, our colleagues from, from Taiwan, uh, especially those associated with the government. Are there any public policy developments in Taiwan government stemming from the earthquake sequence? I don't know. Um, any of the panelists would like to take this one? Uh, <clears throat> maybe we, we, I helped to cover part of the, 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 the question mm -hmm. because my office also helped deliver a lot of policy suggestions mm -hmm. to government for the uh, diverse disaster because my office kind of all has an approach institution. Yes, we do care about the uh, big earthquake uh, that could cast impact to the major parliamentary area in Taiwan. So in the previous few years, we already conduct a series about the scenario analysis of the urban area. We try to highlight their vulnerability. So right now we have complete about six major city in Taiwan about its vulnerability. And the suggestion will be kind of the reference for government official uh, agency to improve the seismic resilience by years. And uh, in the coming phase, we also want to further digitize, digitization of information related to all phases of disaster management. So the, uh, the National Science and Technology Council will invest more in this field to try to upgrade some the uh, ICT technology for the uh, earthquake too. So this is how Taiwan government use policy to enhance uh, seismic resilience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Gilberto, I can add a, a few comments on this. Yes, sure. I, yes. Um, so since the 1999 GGO earthquake, so the, our government also put a lot of effort to increase the seismic resistance of building or bridges. For example, uh, we uh, retrofitted almost uh, all the uh, high school, elementary school buildings, uh, more than uh, uh, 30,000 uh, buildings, which is uh, the work has will be completed 100% by the end of this year. Uh, we also uh, retrofitted uh, almost all the highway uh, significant bridges in the last few years. So this project will also be end in next few years. But unfortunately for the bridges in this rural area uh, has not been uh, retrofitted in this uh, program. So that's uh, the reason. So the bridges in the rural area collapse during the earthquake last year. So okay. we we'll also, uh, the government has put the effort and launched the, uh, 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 a new pro project to build the new bridges in the coming year. Hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, we have uh, maybe one, uh, we'll take one last question and I know we're trying to answer some of the questions by, by typing in answers. Um, and uh, this last question is from David Wall. Um, regarding the earth earthquake early warning system, can anyone, anyone address who used it, how was it used and who benefited or how was it perceived overall? Was there any benefits to the population or infrastructure? I think maybe uh, 
Dr. Lee, would you be able to take this one? Yes, uh, since the 2015, my office resigned a mission from the government to deliver a cell broadcast based on EW to issue the earthquake early warning to the general public. So in case any major earthquake, I think we're seeing about uh, uh, 10 to 15 seconds, the CWB Central Weather Bureau can estimate its magnitude and intensity. And based on threshold value, NCDR will help to disseminate early warning to the location-based area that could over a threshold value. So it's already provide direct benefit to the all rest in Taiwan. Like yesterday, we have the kind of the signal uh, uh, attacks about the PWS system. And uh, not just for the general public, I think also mentioned by the Director Joe, uh, we installed a lot of the sensor and earthquake early warning system. We try to also monitor the health and the possible impact to the critical infrastructure. Like in my slide, I mentioned, we focus on some the health at the major shop in the science park, which contribute a lot of economic income to Taiwan. So I think both the general public uh, government and some private industry, they also receive the benefit from the EEW. So thank you. If anyone want further information, I'm willing to provide the other uh, explanation through the email or anything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're we're about out of time, and in respect of time for for all the uh, speakers and and everybody present, we'll we we'll bring the seminar to a close. Um, just want to quickly thank uh, thank you all, all all the participants for for attending and ERI and uh, Encre for organizing uh, these this event. Uh, we will be posting a recording of the seminar, um, and uh, and uh, that should be up uh, uh, on on YouTube. And with that, I'll I'll turn it over. Um, back to ERI and uh, Elizabeth for any final words. Great, thank you uh, so much for attending this webinar. I just wanted to ask uh, you to please complete the post-webinar survey. It should pop up in your browser when the webinar ends, or if you don't have time right now, you should receive an email with a link to it tomorrow. Uh, you can learn more about ERI at our website. And we just want to acknowledge again that webinars like this are made possible uh, with funding from a cooperative agreement with FEMA, but also uh, by ERI members like many of yourselves. So thank you for that. And thank you again to Enkri and all our colleagues in Taiwan for a great event.